A minor pentatonic scale. So play back to B or play something else on D.
like that one actually. Up, down, up, down, up. Up, down, up, down, up. Up, down, up, down, up. All right, cool. Just shake it out for a quick sec. I'm going to answer a question. Question is, when you play, when I played, what exactly am I recalling from my memory? Visual, note names, finger positions, something else. Something else would be the sound. And I would say yes. The answer is yes. How do we perceive the world? We perceive the world and everything in it through a series of different ways. And those ways can go together. Some of us perceive the world in uh, some ways more than others, right? So that includes looking at it on the page and seeing that dot on the paper. And so that's that's one way to recognize the note G. You see it as a dot. Another way is you see third finger on your D string. You're like, that's the note G. Another way is you hear it. You hear it, the sound of that G. So those are three ways. And it could be even probably another way, which is like a degree and a scale. You recognize it as having a certain quality as a degree and a scale. I'm gonna mute everybody here. Somebody's maybe not muted, right? So the answer is, we perceive things, we understand things in all these different ways. Now think about it. If someone uh, was was never born with the ability to see, then they still under, understand the world in other ways, but they don't see the world, but they still understand things. So that's the same thing when it comes to like, uh, maybe folks who never learned to read music, they don't necessarily learn to read, but they still understand what a G is in, in other ways. And I would argue that, um, Typically, they will understand it uh, better in those other ways, often, right? Often, maybe someone who can't see might develop a better memory. They might develop a better ear. They might, you know, things like this. So we all, we're all on a spectrum in terms of the different ways that we perceive things. But one way that we understand can help another way that we understand. And that's why I say, write it out. Because if you write it out, it's going to help you hear it. It's going to help push your ears further. It's going to help push your fingers. It's going to help you recognize the shapes. A lot of times people will ask me for very reductionist things. They'll be like, isn't it just a finger pattern? No, it's a finger pattern, but that's not everything. And finger patterns work better on a guitar because there's frets and you can it's movable up and down. But it, we don't have that same, same thing. On piano, there's a grid, so you can see things in a lot easier way. We don't have that either. So we have a particular set of situations. What was I personally thinking? I was personally thinking all those things. They all go together for me. When I hear the note G, I hear it. I know it's third finger. I see the dot on the staff paper. I know that it has a relationship as being like the seventh in A. I see, I hear all those things and it will be hard for me or I understand it in all those different ways and I think all those things at once. It's hard for me to separate it. Especially in this context where I do have that full um, uh, internalization. Now, if it was Prokofiev, if I was listening to a Prokofiev concerto, um, then I would hear the G, but I would not have the same recognition of how does that G relate to uh, Prokofiev's deep harmonic language. Because I have not deeply studied to the point of like really understanding uh, Prokofiev's, Prokofiev's harmonic language. So there would be gaps in my level of being able to think about that G. I would just recognize, oh yeah, that's a G, but it wouldn't have the same meaning that it does to me as like, that's a G, and I totally get that in the context of the A minor uh, pentatonic scale and how it's gonna sound on the C major chord and how it's gonna sound on the A minor chord. So, all right. So um, what I want you to do now is melodic rhythms. Melodic rhythms. What's the melodic rhythm? It's the rhythm of the melody. So I'm gonna give you a melodic rhythm and then I want you to use the notes in the scale. That's it, all right? So you can always adapt the melodic rhythm, you can change it. Also remember that with a melodic rhythm, you can always repeat the same note. So if I say, da ga da ga da, you know, then, then I could play. I could play separate notes, but I could also play the same note or the same two notes. So let's start with that one. One, two, three. Dugga, dugga, da. Dugga, dugga, da. If that's too fast for you, then just do dugga, da. Dugga, da. Here's the 
Here's a new, here's a new rhythm. Body, 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 da. Body, 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 da. Ba da, ba da, ba da, da. Two options. Just keep playing them back to back or take a long pause. yourself So we'll just have da ga, da ga, right? We just have that as being the same thing every time, but have a different pickup to it, right? Ba ya da, da ga da ga da da, ba 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 da da, ba do ba ba do ba da da, right? So you can, so you always have da ga. Dug up, but you can try different variations for how you lead into it. Three, four, uh.
shake it out for a sec. So don't forget to be recording yourself. You can hit pause right now and then you can start again. So you have different segments. It's a little easier to scroll through, I find. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate an improvisation on this now and kind of share my thought process so that you can try to use that same thought process. So when I improvise over this, um, first of all, one of the things that I learned from Bobby Floyd is a value that I, that I kind of took on was that I try to make sure every note that I play is in like clearly in rhythm. Now it might be a little bit out of rhythm or a little, you know, but it's really the, the, the goal is to have like a really, really clear, explicit rhythmic intention. And so in this case, it's going to be some, some factor of dugga, 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 dugga. I mean, occasionally I might do a triplet or something, but I highly recommend that you, that you box yourself into something that's on the grid of the eighth notes to start. And then when you listen back later, you're going to say like, well, did every note that I play, did it, was it clearly, you know, somewhat in time or at least have like this, this clear rhythmic intention. Now, here's the thing. The way to succeed 100% of this is to not play. You always have the option for silence. You always have the option for silence. So if you prioritize, if you truly prioritize playing in time, playing clear rhythms, then you have to have, it's a different kind of discipline. It's a mental discipline of knowing when not to play. And that's the most important thing. And that's one of the hardest things for people to develop because we tend to come from an emotional, physical, mm, impulsive type of playing. We want to, we want to, we want to capture the feeling that we have when, when we feel like we're playing good, but the feeling we have is not the same thing as sounding good. That's why I want you to record yourself, right? You start to detach from that physical feeling. Now, eventually you get that physical feeling back, but there's like this little tug of war that's always going on between our head, our listening, our observation, detached observation, and the feeling of feeling good. It's like, I don't know, for example, Olin makes, uh, he's like a, a fine artist. He does ceramics, he does, you know, painting, all this kind of thing. I'm guessing it's similar for a fine artist that like you have an emotional feeling when you're creating art, but you also have to detach and look at it in a way that's just like, what does that look like though? Not how do I feel? as I'm doing it. There's a, there's a subtle, you know, but prof big difference actually. So it doesn't mean I'm going to remove the emotion from the playing. The goal is to create emotion ultimately, but I want you to listen and notice how, first of all, how I use melodic rhythms. Just note it, try to notice the, the melodic rhythms, like pay attention to the melodic rhythm, like, like just hear the rhythm of the lines I play, but then also notice how everything I play hopefully, or a lot of what I play, hopefully, will have a very explicit, clear, accurate, rhythmic um, construction, okay? Two, three. you to think about those two things melodic rhythms and also don't play unless you're going to play in time but that's the goal that's the aspiration and in order for you to, to to actually even know if you do this right there's only one way for you to know if you do this right and it's for you to record yourself and listen back later it's the only way otherwise you're just gonna make up a story don't do that record yourself here we go two you got it uh.
same thing, but you can also uh, expand it to use the C major scale if you want. And when I say C major scale, you know that I don't mean, uh, you know that what I mean by that is just a key signature, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, when um, all notes are natural. So what you'll see is that the, the A minor pentatonic scale, which is the same as the C major pentatonic scale, that it's a little bit safer. It's like you can kind of use that in a totally indiscriminate way. You can literally use any of those notes in the scale and they'll pretty much always sound good. But when you use the C major scale, you'll have a little more option to, uh, to make different colors. And, um, but it's more dangerous. <laughs> it's more dangerous. So that's a way though, if you want to explore this, 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 this difference between the A minor, pen, the pentatonic sound versus the major scale sound, because because ultimately we can combine them. And there's one other pentatonic scale if you really want to knock yourself out. That would be the E minor pentatonic scale. The E minor pentatonic scale. I'll put the notes in the chat. E, G, A, B, D. Those are the notes of the E minor. Again, if you're going to try to do that, though, I would write it out the same way that you wrote out the A minor pentatonic scale. I would write it out. I don't feel like most people, I could be wrong, but I don't feel like you need to write out the C major scale as if you can think of a key signature. Um, but for pentatonics, it's kind of different. I feel like we just kind of have to memorize those five notes because it's like different. Um, now, extra bonus points if you're a ninja then you can start to voice lead the two scales. And I'm gonna come back to this later throughout the course. And some of you, a lot of you, just drink a cup of coffee and ignore me for the next 30 seconds because it's too much. So this is what it looks like to voice lead the, the two pentatonic scales. So I have, uh, I have um, A minor. That's my A minor pentatonic scale. Now I'm gonna go to the nearest note in the E minor pentatonic scale, and I'm gonna start from there. It's only one different note. But I'm gonna go to A, play the A minor scale, and then from A, play the E minor. And then A minor, E minor, D, A minor, E. So if you if we if we hear what that sounds like, I'm gonna voice lead the E minor and the A minor pentatonic scale. E minor, A minor, E minor, A minor, E minor, A minor. So that's voice leading two different scales. Voice leading two different scales. What does it mean to voice lead two different scales? It means you move, you're just moving from the same note or as close as possible, right? So it's like E minor pentatonic, A minor pentatonic, E minor, A minor, E minor, A minor, E minor, A minor. E minor. Cut. So that's the ultimate ninja trick. So those are the options you have and keep doing what you were doing otherwise. Ready and.
Okay, let's do the same thing on a similar but different groove. This is the groove from Stairway to Heaven. I want you to notice the similarities first. Let's just listen to the two. So this is, first of all, I'm just going to explain what this one is that we were just listening to. So it goes from a C major 7 to an A minor 7, right? So it's a C, C major 7, boom. One major to six minor. It's just two chords. It's a two, two, two chord vamp. This is a three chord vamp. We're going from A minor to G major to F major. And this is Stairway to Heaven. Specifically, it's the outro to Stairway to Heaven. It's where the guitar solo happens at the very end of the song. I really kind of laid into that, uh, the major seven on the, on the F chord. So Jimmy Page, the soloist in Led Zeppelin, uh, he plays every pretty most of the notes that he plays are all from the A minor pentatonic scale, um, and on his classic on the classic solo, right? There's a couple places though where he goes into the C major scale and plays the note B, you know, plays the note B, which also is part of the E minor pentatonic. So in this one, you can definitely use just A minor pentatonic. You can also augment it with the C major scale. You can also explore that E minor pentatonic variation, although I don't think that'll work as well as it did on the other one. But um, tempo is pretty, pretty similar. Let's just listen to the tempos. And now let's listen to the tempo of the other one. But it's a different groove, right? So all of a sudden we go from, I don't know what that would be considered, R&B, I guess, some kind of R&B groove. And then, but this one is like clearly a rock groove. All right, so here you go. Here's your uh, Led Zeppelin groove. Three, four. here A G F A minor G major F major add the major seven Corrected. Jimmy Page does play an F. He plays it right here. Right there. <laughs> he knows that stuff. I just, I just had to correct myself there. Yo, that was a little correction. Okay, ready, go. plays the F on the F chord though. Interesting. Thank you. 
the groove factor here because I know everybody wants to chop. It's amazing, you know. I, I go to teachers. Uh, go to class. I've been in thousands of school classrooms. Yesterday, I was at the Governor's School for the Arts in South Carolina for four hours. I did a clinic with eighth through twelfth grade students, and then I went and did an hour presentation at Furman University. Um, and uh, it's it's amazing because like the teachers will say like, "Will you come in and and uh, you know and do a presentation? What do you want to present?" And I'm like, "Okay, so I'm going to present like." this entire multifaceted curriculum and the outcome is that the students are going to become more functional musicians. You're going to have foster a jamming culture, like more diverse, you know, styles of music and ways of learning, uh, improvisation, applications of harmony, you know, rhythm, you know, arranging composition. I'm like, you know, I've been working on this curriculum for, you know, about 30 years now. And uh, I'd like, you know, like to empower your students and your teachers. To do that. And like, could you just come and teach us how to chop I get that all the time. It's like, could you just, we just want you, could maybe just give us an hour of class and just teach us how to chop. Which my interpretation of this, okay, just, and I'll try not to make it too long of a story, but it's like, that's a very classical way of thinking. So just show me how to do this thing. But then we don't really get a deeper insight into all this other stuff, right? <clears throat> so when I try to teach this concept about uh, strum bowing or whatever you want to think of it, I try to teach everybody about this principle of down up, down up, down up, down up, right? where you're, um, you're physically um, subdividing. So, so right here, it would look like. That's basically the inner voices pattern. That might be too much for some people. So, um, <clears throat> but the same thing, whether I do it here or whether I do it here and add the chop. If I do it here and add the chop, it'll sound like this. different voicings but it's the same thing it's the same motion in your arm right so you can start it here so some different ways we could practice that we could just do another way would be to do so let's try some of that stuff here we go I showed you in the beginning. You play four, you four. Stephen Vance for a second. Not really. 